and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Today I'll be finishing off my E3 2011 coverage with the five games of the show that I was unsold on at this year's event, and the game which I consider my shame of the show. Now, quickly to get this out of the way, what does it take to get on my unsold list? First, I have to be interested in the game in the first place. Either it has to be a type of game that I am interested in, or otherwise it's a game where, having heard about it before the show, it caught my attention, it caught my interest, it had me peaked, uh, had my interest peaked, and, make, and made me want to see more about it. Otherwise, it had to be something where, again, I just heard about it for the first time at the show, and it had to be something that I would care about. Like, for example, Saints, the Saints Row series has never been my cup of tea. I prefer my open-world action games more in the Grand Theft Auto or in the style of Mafia, th of Mafia 2. So, with that in mind, let's get started. First up at this year's show that was oh, I was unsold on was Asher's Wrath. This is a game which kind of caught my interest. I liked Bayonetta and its very over-the-top action style. But, well, and that's what caught my attention here, is I saw these opening trailers with your main character fighting the giant forefinger of Buddha coming down from on heaven to skish him. And it's like, hey, that looks cool, that, look, that looks fun. I would like to see more about this. This could be a really fun, over-the-top Bayonetta-esque action game with a variety of gameplay styles, some combo-based action, a little bit of quick time of any stuff, but lots more in-character action stuff. And I want to see where this would go. Well, from what we saw at E3, I found out where it went, and it went in the direction of Ninja, of Ninja Blade. For those unfamiliar with Ninja Blade, that was a game basically trying to, to do the Ninja Gaiden kind of thing, except instead of having the main character be a over-the-top... Um, well, the top of being sort of, oh, but the character was on was Ryu Hayabusa, but the action wasn't the same. The action was basically long strings of quick time event sequences. Um, there was some running around slash up stuff, but the quick time event sequences overshadowed it in terms of the amount of it to amount of that type of gameplay to other types. So that's what we got there. Um, and that's what, and that's what Ashura's Wrath looked, Ashura's Wrath looked like to me. Most of the gameplay footage we saw was quick time event stuff, where hit triangle to catch a projectile thrown at you and throw it back. There was a little bit of like running around shooting stuff, kind of in a, uh, semi-fantasy zone kind of sense, not fantasy zone. Um, Space Harrier type sense, but that's I mean that, that's not what I was looking for here. So I was disappointed with this, and so that made my unsold list. Next up is XCOM. I'm not a gigantic XCOM fan, but I know the series, and I like the concepts in it. And even though I've had problems with the with the game being perhaps a little too difficult for me. I value it for what it does. It is, without beyond a doubt, one of the best turn-based action series of all time. Yes, there was the first-person shooter. Yes, there was the Wing Commander ripoff. But, ultimately, when XCOM was at its best, it was doing strategy. Preferably turn-based. And, I what I... I had, was kind of willing to give this a, give this a bit of a shot coming into E3 as far as I wanted to see more gameplay because we hadn't seen really much before at all. And this really didn't catch my interest. Um, instead of controlling a, a substantial team of characters with all of whom could potentially die over the course of the mission and stay dead, um, instead you're basically controlling a... you're, you're leading a three-man team there's technological development, but it feel but the tech development doesn't feel 
that different or that really um, distinguished from, say, basically choosing between whether to pick up a gun and use it or take it back and be able to use a di be able to use one of your own SMGs next time as opposed to using a Russian SMG or something like that. Um, it doesn't. It really not my thing. Where we're getting here, and probably what's a little more disappointing is this is a time where turn-based strategy could potentially come into its own in a new way. Um, maybe not as a full sixty-dollar release, but maybe maybe it could. Um, for a downloadable title, I could see doing a turn-based action game in the classic style of XCOM, but maybe doing something in a bit in the Final Fantasy Tactics, the Advanced, not much Final Fantasy Tactics, or um, the Tactics Ogre, or the Fire Emblem Sense, where it's not necessarily a big game in terms of file size. But, or in terms of highly advanced graphics, but using turn-based elements in that fashion. Uh, if you did want to go the full, big budget, super high-res graphics, $60 title, I could see giving this game a sort of tactical control style similar to the um, Valkyria Chronicles games here. I could see that working really well. But that's not what we, but that's not what we got here. Instead, it's very much a first-person a first-person shooter with a few elements taken from Mass Effect in this. And that's not really what I'm looking for. I'm going to pass on this. I will probably never, never play this game. Frankly. I might rent it, maybe. Just maybe. If I hear really spectacular things about it. And, frankly, I don't think I'll be hearing really spectacular things about it. Which is unfortunate for the XCOM franchise as a whole. Next up is Tomb Raider. I'd seen some coverage in Game Informer of this, and I kind of like the idea of a reboot here. I kind of like the idea of taking Laura, of basically doing a Tomb Raider origin thing, of seeing how Laura Croft became the stoic badass that we know, or at least the stoic hyper-proficient badass that we know. But this isn't what I was looking for. The Laura we saw in, we see in the gameplay footage trailers at this year's E3 feels like a character out of the movie Descent. She feels like the final, gore, final girl in a torture porn flick. The girl who escapes in Descent, for example, or that sort of thing. She may... She, it, look, it looks like coming out of this that Laura isn't going to be coming out of this as much as a victor as still something of a traumatized victim. Which is unfortunate, because currently, of the badass female video game characters who haven't undergone some sort of decay in video games, in terms of going from badass to being much more of a weaker character, we have Femme Shepard, maybe possibly Bayonetta, and depending how you look at it, Lightning from Final Fantasy XIII. Considering the attitude towards women in Japanese culture and Japanese popular culture, the fact that two of these characters are Japanese is rather surprising. I mean, we used to have Laura Croft before, not that long ago, before this current console generation, it was Laura Croft and Seamus Aaron. As far as, like, long-term franchise running badass characters. We then got Femme Shepard, which was awesome. We got Bayonetta. We got, to a certain degree, Lightning. And then Other M happened. And now Metroid, and now Seamus Aaron won't save her own life unless a man tells her to. And now we have, well, the Tomb Raider, and we have Laura Croft, who is the vic who is the moaning, groaning, gasping, not quite weeping yet, but gasping victim 
of the descent of various other torture porn films. Just to, just to, it just to get this out of the way. If you're looking for trying to emulate a character from film to 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 make be your fun action movie action movie video game heroine, don't go to the movie The Last House on the Left or not The Last House on the Left. Don't go to I Spit on Your Grave as your inspiration. That's not the way to go. There are better ways to do this. Next up is Need for Speed to Run. Need for Speed to Run. I was kind of interested in this. I've actually taken a few surveys, which at the time I didn't know were related to this game. I've mentioned this in earlier videos. Um, related to typeface of the title, the cars that would be in the expansion, downloadable content stuff, that sort of thing. So, I kind of knew coming in what to expect. As, well, not, not, not what to expect, but I knew that this game was coming. I knew that we were getting a new Need for Speed racing game. Um, and while... At the start of the E3 presentation for this game, when I saw the sort of cannonball run concept, that caught my interest. It's nice, it's, it's different from the open world style to, um, you're all in one city type gameplay of earlier games because it often leads to track reuse over the course of the game. But instead, we're watching the E3 trailer and the guy got out of the car and we got a quick time action event sequence. <sighs> because quick, because getting on foot worked so well for Driver. In all seriousness, this game doesn't really interest me. Part of what I like about car games and racing games is getting a car, sticking with it, maybe upgrading to a better car when you get enough points or cash or whatever to get a better car. I don't want to be forced out of one car and stuck into another car because of basically um, arbitrary gameplay guidelines of, well, we need to have you drive a Ford um, police interceptor now. Or Dodge Charger or whatever the current standard police car of choice is now. There's, there's got to be a better way to have done this. And so it kept the cannonball run concept. Maybe something along the lines of um, the earlier black box Need for Speed games with the live action really silly over the top cutscenes. That could have worked just as well. And kept that same, uh, to just use that to bridge the races for this concept. Possibly use something in those cutscenes to set up some limitation or something you have to overcome over the course in this particular race. Um, finally, my top, on my five, I wouldn't call it top five, but my five unsold games of the show is Brothers in Arms Furious 4. The earlier games in the Brothers in Arms series really had a strong sense of realism. They felt like some, like they, the design team for these games had read all of Cornelius Ryan's books, like *The Longest Day* and *A, a Bridge Too Far*. Had watched *Saving Private Ryan*. Had watched the movies of those earlier Cornelius Ryan books. Had watched *Band of Brothers* and read Stephen Ambrose's books on World War II, and took all of that, all that feedback to make a really good World War II game that really shows respect for those who fought in World War II and at the same time provides fun gameplay that's different than what everyone else is doing in their World War II games. That, and that's what really made those games appeal to me. And then we get Furious 4, which is basically Inglorious Bastards the game. I mean, we have the grindhouse art style. We have an opening. We have a cutscene sequence which looks like it's taken right out of *Inglorious Bastards*, except it's a beer hall instead of a instead of a nightclub. We get we have a Native American character with a mohawk, war paint, and thro who throws tomahawks. I'm trying to think of a way to make that character more of a racial stereotype, and short of having while still making him come across as a GI, and sort of having him wear fe having him 
wearing a feathers head, feathered headdress instead of a helmet. I can't think of anything. This is just... I understand that World War II games are getting old. I understand that World War II games don't have the same appeal that they used to have. That audiences are getting jaded. But there's a better way to fix this than doing the same... than adapting the same sort of World War II movie concept that's been done five billion times before. I mean, all you have to do is add occult stuff and your Nazi occult stuff and it's almost a Wolfenstein game. There's just, there's got to be a better way to do this than the, to make a good World War II game than to go Grindhouse. And not even go originally Grindhouse, just go in Grindhouse. It feels like Gearbox got stuck in the Duke Nukem Forever zone, the same way that once Frank Miller started doing Sin City, Frank kind of got stuck, got stuck in Basin City and started writing all his female characters as Basin City horrors, and started doing his narration style like something out of Sin City, which is why we got the goddamn Batman. We'll see. But, I'm not, but the, I can't see this game turning out well at all. And finally, I'm going to get to my shame of the show. This spot almost went to Brothers in Arms Fears 4. But, I found a game at E3, that was worse. That was that offended me more than Furious Four did. And that game was Blackwater. The game puts you in the shoes of a team of all well, Caucasian American mercenaries working for Blackwater, who are sent into a small African village to protect the people from an evil well, well not small village, but small African nation to protect the people from this evil genocidal, genocidal warlord who's running the country. And the game is a connect game kind of an on-rails shooter a la Time Crisis except you're using your hand instead of you're using a light gun and different characters with different special abilities. Blah blah blah, that's all. That sounds like I mean, th that part all on its own might work for a might work for a small little basically shovelware possibly a decent shovelware game on its own might work for even for a time crisis game on its own and then you add Blackwater because your team works for Blackwater he work, works for the private military corporation that is most infamous in the, the infamous for Basically being trick or happy, having no problems or qualms with gunning down civilians, and for basically not even having really any sense of, oh, you know, <sighs> rules of engagement. The, I can't help, and they're, they're, Image problems got so bad they changed the name of the company. They're not actually called Blackboard anymore. They're called Z X E um, Services. I mean, this is the this is the company which basically hires people who aren't fit for them, who don't fit into the military, but you still want to shoot stuff. Either because they can't necessarily handle the same um, rigorous, uh, I just call it moral code, or the instructional structure, and instead want to go, but, but still want to go out and shoot guys in the face. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a group of people who are, and then no one will get in trouble for this if they ever find out where I live, who are quite mentally okay. And so we have this game here, which is basically Mighty Whitey the game. A bunch of white dudes go in to save a bunch of black dudes who can't protect themselves from even more evil black dudes. I just... God... 
I don't know if we, I don't know whether to slow clap black water for this blatant case of attempting of spin control and trying to rebuild PR, not through doing good things, not through doing the right thing, but through just throwing money at the problem and hope that people forget about what about the horrible things they did. I mean, for all the nasty things that, say, the 1800s robber barons like Andrew Carnegie did, they tried to fix things somewhat as far as their image is concerned by throwing lots of money at the arts and civic projects and that sort of thing. So that my, my, maybe while the world wasn't as good a place as it was when they left, it was better. Than the, it was better than they made it. And this isn't that. This is... This is the video game equivalent of a propaganda film. Of a corporately spent propaganda film. Made by the company which for the last six to seven years was synonymous for evil, psychotic, private military contractors. I mean, 90% of the evil, psychotic, private military contractors in films in the past few years have had their names be some modified version of Blackwater. Whether it's Black Sky, Black Cloud, Clearwater, um... Oh god all sorts of nasty, stupid, stupid stuff. Oh, let's see, like... Oh, all sorts of really fun, fun, fun stuff. Um... Let's see, or anything like... Black River Corporation in... Knight Rider, Black Thorn in The Unit, the Starkwood Corporation in 24. Um... We had... Um, Black Forest in the A-Team. My god. I could go on. This is not a good game. I haven't played it yet, and this game kind of, when I saw this, I kind of threw up my mouth a little. This isn't a game that's worth your money. This is a game, in fact, that deserves to fail. And shame on the developers of this game, and shame on the publishers of this game, for putting this out. I can't really shame Blackwater. They don't have any shame left. This is not a good... Just, yeah, this is beyond a doubt my shame of the show. And on that light and fluffy note, we are done with my with E3 coverage. Which is good because E3 has been over for almost a week. Um, so next, w so next video is going to go on a slightly different note and talk a bit more about who I am, why you should care about what I have to say, and what kind of stuff we'll expect to see in this, this in the future. Now that I can't talk about E3 anymore, look forward to look forward to that video, and I'll see you next time.